I love hearing you all sing. It's just a glorious thing to hear the praises of God's people. Amen. It's just so encouraging. Well, let's open our Bibles to, um, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17 in the, in the uh, Old Testament. If you need a Bible, raise your hand and one of the ushers will be sure to get one to you. I want you kids to, to pay particular attention to the study today because I'm going to ask you some questions and your parents have presents for you if you, no, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm totally kidding, I just made that up just to, <clears throat> but I want you to pay close attention, how many of you kids have ever heard of the story David and Goliath, the story of David and Goliath, raise your hand if you, how many of your parents have heard that story David and Goliath, well that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this morning and when I was a young boy, I absolutely loved, and I have to admit, uh, I still love sword fight movies. How many of you love sword fight movies? I love sword fight movies. I, I would watch a movie and then I'd become the character. In fact, I would say that that's probably the case with most boys, maybe a few girls. But we can always count on a, <clears throat> on a few uh, teenage Ninja Turtles at our Harvest Festivals, and I, I have to admit to you, one of the reasons I'm not into those is because they didn't have them when I was a kid. We, we had like, we, we didn't have animals that were doing the sword fighting. We had just men that did, and boys that imagined uh, the sword fighting. I grew up with movies like Ben-Hur and Ivanhoe, and, and the original Spartacus with uh, Kirk Douglas, and Prince Valiant, and Sword of Lancelot, and the list goes on and on and on. In fact, one of the favorite toys of our grandchildren, our grandsons when they come, is a, a little sword and a shield, rubber sword and shield that we picked up at Ikea probably seven or eight years ago. And every time they come, they go right to the closet, they get that, and they just start fighting imaginary things. And Jack, every time he comes, he'll come to me and he'll say, Pa, can I borrow that for a little while and take it home? And, and, uh, and I always tell him no, because what if I want to play with it? No, I don't tell him that what if I want to play with it. <clears throat> but I say, you know, we keep it there. And I say, we want to keep it here so that it'll always be here for you when you come and get it. And all the battles I ever fought with my imagination, with swords and with shields, they were make-believe. But what we're going to be looking at this morning, kids, what we're going to be looking at this morning, uh, parents, isn't make-believe. It is the absolute truth. And rather than take the time to, to read it all through and then study it, we're going to read through it together. And we're going to consider together what the Lord is speaking to us through this true story. This is the account of a battle that was fought between the Philistines who were enemies of God and the Israelites who were God's chosen people. And we're going to see in this story that there are many parallels to what we face today. I've entitled this message, Facing Goliath. And although we may not be facing an actual giant named Goliath, as in the case of David, what we do know and what we will see is that we do indeed face many giants. We face many obstacles in this life. One I, I mentioned about uh, uh, that we're going to be praying about and looking at on Wednesday. So let's pray. Let's ask God to still our hearts to to quiet the children's hearts so that they can hear your truth because I'm going to have, and I want you kids to pay close attention because I'm going to have an assignment for you and your family. This is going to be an opportunity for you to find out if your parents have been listening uh, today, okay? So listen carefully so you'll be able to find out and then when they go, well, I wasn't listening, then what, what are you going to do? Send them to their room. Send them to their room or uh, send them to bed without any... Supper. Now, some of them are going to not pay attention because they're going to want you to send them to bed early. How many of you parents who say, man, I hope. How many of you would love to get sent to your room? I can remember why. I, I wish I could send myself to my room when you're, when you're raising children. So let's pray and let's begin to look at this wonderful, wonderful story. Father, we ask that you would <clears throat> open our hearts to your word we pray that you'd give us an attentiveness 
to what you want to speak to us for just the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes. We love you, Lord. We need to know you. And we do face difficulties, Lord. We do uh, face many Goliaths, Lord God. And, and they seek to rob, kill, and destroy our lives and our families and our relationship with you. So in Jesus' name, we ask that you would put a hedge of protection around this place, that we would hear what it is the Spirit has for us. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 17. It says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle. And they were gathered at Sukkah, which belongs to Judah. They camped between Sukkah and Azekah in Ephs Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah. And they drew up in battle array. I want you to just imagine, when I, when I read that, I think of, of those scenes when the, when the vroom, doom, 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 doom. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Doom, doom, doom. And there's always like a bazillion of the bad guys and a smaller group of, of the younger guys. That's, uh, and, and a smaller group of, of the guys that are really going to win the battle. Well, this really happened, and they were, they were drawing up in battle array. It says, against the Philistines, verse 3, the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And so the battle lines are drawn, and the men are marching into place, and in the movies, someone is always outnumbered. And we see that that, in, in many respects, is the case here except we know that when God is on our side, uh, we're always going to win. And it says that there was a champion, look at verse 4, a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had a bronze armor on his legs, a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and his shield bearer went before him. Goliath was a massive man. He was a warrior. He was a champion. He was over nine feet tall. His armor weighed 150 pounds. And his spear alone weighed 20 pounds. And he's mocking God. He's mocking the God of the children of Israel. Look what it says in verse 8. He stood and cried out to the armies of Israel. And he said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now, I know that there are a, a number of you uh, uh, men and a few women that love to trash talk. It's just about whether it's a sports event or whatever the case. And, uh, and I, I like to talk trash. I, I like to, I'm, I'm not very good at many things. And so what I do is I go in and I figure, okay, maybe I'll just rattle them a little bit just by talking trash. And so I got to family camp and there were some guys throwing horseshoes. And uh, I start tackling trash right away. I said, you guys ready to lose? I said, you guys got anything left in you? And I started, and they, they whomped me. I mean, I didn't even, I think I won like one or maybe two games. Well, Goliath, he was a champion. He was a proven warrior. You could bet that he could back up what he was saying, and apparently the Israelites knew it because look what it says. It says that they were terrified. And when you defy God's people, then you're defying God. And look at the response in verse 11. It says, when Saul and Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Have you ever been dismayed and greatly afraid? I immediately, how many of you kids have ever been afraid? Any of you kids? I remember when I was six years old, and I went to the store 
and I lived in a kind of a rough neighborhood in Española, New Mexico, and I went to the store and I bought a little bag of candy, and I'll never forget this. I was walking home, and there was three little kids that were coming, and it was a little rough part of town. And I remember like it was yesterday, I said to myself, this is not going to be a good situation. And I knew these kids were rough and tough. There were three of them. There was one of me, and I thought, okay, last ditch effort, I'm going to offer them my candy. And so I said, with a nervous voice, would you like some candy? And not only did they want some candy, but they grabbed the candy, they beat me up, and they went off, and they ran off. I was terrified of those kids in that neighborhood. I was dismayed. And there's a lot of things that, that we can be dismayed about. There's a lot of things that we can be terrified about. And yet... We see in verse 12 a, a, a pause in the story and we learn something about David as a young boy. Look at verse 12. It's as though we leave that battle scene for a moment and we see that the, that the author writes, Now David was the son of, of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse and who had eight sons. And the man was old, advanced in years in the days of Saul. The three oldest sons of Jesse had gone to follow Saul to the battle line. They were with Saul. They were listening to the taunting of Goliath. The names of his three sons who went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest. How old do you think David was? Kids, how old do you think David was when he fought Goliath? Any guess? What's that? Ten? Okay, any other guesses? What would you say? 16, 10? Okay, he was probably between the ages of 12 and 16 years old. So he was a young boy. And the three oldest followed Saul. Verse 15 says, But David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So that's a little snapshot of David. Now we go to verse 16, back to the battle scene, and it says that the Philistine, that the Goliath, drew near and presented himself 40 days, morning and evening. So for 40 days, two times each day, Goliath would come out, and he would taunt the Israelites, and these guys were scared. Now, I would love to say that it, when I was six years old and I got beat up by those guys and they took my candy, I would love to say that I wasn't, never, I wasn't ever scared again after that. But sure enough, at eighth grade, there was Jim Anderson. Jim Anderson was the toughest kid in junior high. I mean, he was tough. He was the best athlete in school, and he was tough. Everybody knew it, and he smoked. Now, back then, if you smoked, you, it, it was like you were double tough uh, because you, you, you smoked because you got kicked out of school if they found out. And so one day he decides, I'm going to be his victim. And he says to me, he says, Ron, I want you to bring me candy tomorrow. I'm going to pound you. That means I'm going to beat you up. So I was having probably like flashbacks. I can't believe this is happening uh, again all these years later. So every day I would come and I would give him my peace offering. Here, here, here's the candy. And every day he'd say, make sure you have that candy tomorrow. I'm going to pound you. And I'd bring it every day. And finally, I, I can't remember if I ran out of money. I can't remember. But I just finally said, this is ridiculous. I'd rather get beat up than have to keep doing this day after day after day. I was terrified, I was threatened, I was dismayed, and that's what we see with the people. They were terrified. He was taunting them over and over and over again, morning and night for 40 days. In the meantime, look at verse 17. Jesse says to his son David, 12 to 16 years old, Take now for your brothers an ephah of, of this dried grain and these ten loaves, and run to your brothers at the camp, and carry these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers fare, and bring back news of them. Now Saul and, and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. Now this is interesting to me. We don't really see any, any uh, idea that there was actual fighting going on. 
But we know that there was a, probably a lot of racket that was taking place. Look what it says in verse 20. It says, David rose in the morning. He left the sheep with a keeper. He took the things. He went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for battle. So you know what that means? There was a lot of rattling of the sabers. Have you ever heard that saying? They're shaking the sabers. All right. Hey, 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 hey. Have you ever done that? You, you, you act like you're going to have this big fight, and you never quite fight. You just, you know, hey, 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 you're just always acting like it's going to be a fight. And that seems to be what's happening here. They're rattling their sabers. They're, yay, they're trying to get themselves like that, but nothing's happening. Because Goliath just keeps coming out, and he's taunting them night and day. It says in verse 21, for Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. And then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines. And he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. Now David's a young boy. David's 12 to 16 years old. And all the men of Israel, all the men in battle array, all the men that had been rattling their sabers and just talking, hey, hey, getting all worked up, trying to get enough nerve to go and fight. David comes in, this boy comes in, and he hears them. And it says all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were dreadfully afraid so day by day the same thing and every time Goliath would threaten them they fled and they remained dreadfully afraid except something's about to change what do you think's about to change kids what do you think's going to change huh David David and when you think about it what we read here has really shaped stories and encouraged people for years and years. It never gets old. How many Rocky movies have you seen? Where, you know, in fact, the most recent one, he's like, what, 80 or something, and he's still going to pull, pull one more off? And at the very end, you're thinking, is he going to do it? Is he going to do it? You know he's going to do it. And at the end, everybody's cheering, and he's yelling, Adrian, or whatever the case may be. Or how about Karate Kid? You know it's fake. You know it's not real. He's a little scrawny guy. The other guy's much better. And yet when he goes up to do the karate kick, or, uh, the, the cr crane kick, what is, everybody's waiting, waiting. And when it happens, when he hits, bam, everybody's screaming and yelling. Why? Because there's something that's energizing about a little guy taking a big guy down. Uh, the Seahawks were energized a couple years ago because... I was pretty cocky, pretty confident. The Broncos were going to take them down. Oh, my word. We got slaughtered. Now, I'm not going to say anything about the game this last week. But anyway, <laughs> we're, we're, we're conditioned. Or do you remember? And those are, just, those are just Hollywood movies. But how about, do you remember the movie, Remember the Titans? Or Miracle? Or just recently, how many of you have seen uh, McFarland? Uh, McFarland's, I, that happens a lot with even the adults when I teach. They just get so emotional from my preaching that they just, sometimes uh, grown men and women, they'll just break down crying like that. <clears throat> and so, so we, we, we see in, in movies when we know that it's true, like just recently the, the McFarland movie, this cross-country team, and, and they didn't even have cross-country. And at the very end, uh, those who was, were least expected to dominate, uh, dominate. And, and this is such a great story that, that we know is true of a young boy who put his trust and his faith in God. Pay close attention here. And where the final confidence comes from, look at verse 25. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he's come up to, to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. And then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Now pay close attention to, to David's heart and his attitude. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, uh, 
David's not talking trash here. David just sees that, that this guy's mocking my God. And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. So David confidently and he boldly and he rightly questions who this man is. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Notice uncircumcised Philistine. Goliath was an enemy of God. Circumcision was, was a, a, a right of a covenant relationship with God. It was an identification that we are God's people. And so the author here emphasizes, who is this uncircumcised Philistine, David says. And there are a lot of enemies of God in our world today. And they're mocking God. Goliaths everywhere we turn, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our, give, in our government. Planned Parenthood is an enemy of God. Mocking God. They talk a lot of trash. They're haters of God. And as we see here, sometimes even our own family members can discourage us. Look at this little family feud we get here. Brothers being brothers. Look at verse 28. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the man. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you've come down to see the battle. And I love David's response. I love just how, how natural it is. What have I done now? <laughs> what are you guys so mad about? Is there not a cause? And then he turned from him toward another, and he said the same thing. And these people answered him as the first ones did. Now, I like this part of the story because it makes it all the more real. Typical brothers not getting along. And now David is about to do some boasting here. But he's not going to boast in himself. Look what it says in verse 31. When the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and Saul sent for David. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Now this is, a, this is a boy. This is a boy and he's going to fight Goliath, this nine-foot giant. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him for you're a youth and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. What does David say? David says, who is this guy? Who does this guy think he is to mock my God? David says, I'll fight him. And notice, this is key. This is key. Look at verse 37. Who does David put his confidence in? Does he put it in his ability? Who does he put his confidence in? He puts it in God. He puts it in the Lord. Look what he says in verse 37. The Lord who delivered me from the paw and the lion, from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. David had seen God work on his behalf in dangerous situations before. And for some of you kids, it's hard for you to see this because maybe your parents have protected you or you've been protected from dangerous situations but the day will come when you will face dangerous situations and God will work on your behalf. And David understands this and he's not about to let this giant shake his faith. And when we find ourselves shaken, we need to think back to all the times the Lord has come through for us as a reminder that there is nothing too hard for God. And for those of us who lived, lived any amount of life we know this to be true. Saul agrees. 
He's tired of the taunting day after day after day. But notice here in verse 38, what does he do? He doesn't rely on God. He relies on his own thinking. Look at verse 38. So Saul clothed David, this boy, with a man's armor. He put on a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor, and he tried to walk, for he had not tested them. He couldn't walk. He had this armor on him. He had this, this helmet that was probably too big for him flopping around on his head. He was dragging this sword around and he couldn't even move. He couldn't even walk. And so he said to Saul, I cannot walk with these. I've not tested them. So David took them off. <clears throat> now Saul at this time, if you know anything about Saul, he had lost his anointing. He had lost his faith. That's why he was fearful. He wasn't operating in the strength of the Lord. And so he reverts to equipping David in the manner that he thought best. Now listen to the application to our lives. We make a huge mistake when we fight battles in our own strength. And that's why the Psalms are so valuable. We should go to prayer and we should read David's Psalms when he would write those and just displaying how God had cared for him and protected him when he was fighting the, the lions and the bears and those things that were seeking to destroy him. And I want to ask you parents this. And some of you kids can ask your parents this question. What do your children see as you face daily Goliaths? What do they see day to day as you face Goliaths? Do they see moms and dads of faith? Like David? Or do they see fear and dread of circumstances like the Israelite army? Verse 40 says, David took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and he put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and he began drawing near to David. And the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you should come to me with sticks? He was calling David a stick. You're like a little toothpick out there. What am I, some dog that you're going to send me a boy with a little slingshot? And it says... That the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So Goliath mocks David. Uh, there are people, there are Goliaths in the world uh, today who, who mock God's people. And this is what Goliath does. He mocks David. He says, who's this punk kid? And David, notice, he doesn't even think about it. All he thinks about is, this big guy is mocking my God. And pay close to his response here in verse 44. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the people, of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, Don't miss this. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. In other words, David says, you come in your strength, but you better look out, buddy, because I'm coming in God's strength. And what is about to happen is all about who God is when we stay out of his way. Listen, there is no giant in our lives who is bigger or more powerful than God. Amen? There is no circumstance. There is no giant. There is no Goliath. There is no boss. There is no uh, neighbor. There, There is nothing in our lives who is bigger than our God. Romans 8.31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Jeremiah 32.17, there is nothing too hard for God. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do you believe that? And if you do, let me ask you this. Do your children know 
you believe that. Because I guarantee you're going to face something. And you know your kids are watching you. You know your kids are watching you. Our children are reflections of us. And if you're fearful of the giants, chances are they will be fearful as well. But if you're confident, not in your own strength, but in the Lord's strength, then there's a good chance they will follow suit. And so look at what we see happen here in verse 46. David says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you, and I will take your head from you, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Who will deliver them? What is David saying? Who will deliver them? Who? God. The Lord. The Lord will deliver them. Why will he deliver them? It tells us. Why, does, why will he deliver them? So that all the earth would know there's a God in Israel. Why is the Lord going to prevail in the things that are going on in our world today? Because the day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. And if you're fighting the battle on your own, you're going to lose. But if you're getting out of the way, and if you're trusting in the Lord, the Lord will prevail. And I absolutely love this part of the text. Look at verse 48. So it was when the Philistine arose. Now I want you to get this picture in your mind. He arises, nine feet of man, 150 pounds of armor, a 20-pound spear. <coughs> and when he arose... And he came and drew near to meet David. What did David do? Whoa! This guy's a lot bigger down here in the valley than he looked from up there. I'm out of here. No! Look what it says. It says David hurried and he ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David ran to the enemy. It wasn't like me. I, I shared this story with you a number, uh, a number of months ago or but when I was playing football with my boys in the front yard, and we, I decided to kick it to him, to the boys. And we were playing in the street, and there was a, there was a car parked in front of a house, and they nicknamed the man Mr. Meanie. And the reason they named him Mr. Meanie is because he was a mean guy, and he'd come out and he'd yell, you boys, get that football off my... So they said, Dad, don't kick it, Dad, don't kick it. And I was pretty confident in my kicking skills, which I shouldn't have been. And I kicked it, and I watched in horror as it was headed right towards Mr. Meany's car. And it banged the hood of his car it was so loud, I couldn't believe it. And so what did I do? I didn't pull a David, man. I pulled, I turned around, and I hightailed it out of there. I ran, and I hid back behind our house. And I left my three little boys standing in the street for Mr. Meany. What a wimp. What a chicken I was. And finally, as I was standing behind the house, just cowering, three little boys, wham, 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 they were sitting right next to me. What kind of example was I setting to them? I said, come on, guys. And I went and I knocked on the door and thanked the good Lord, Mr. Meany, uh, wasn't there. <laughs> David, listen, David didn't pull a Pastor Ron. David runs to meet Goliath. No fear. No fear. There's no fear with David. Why? Because his confidence is in the Lord. And look at the end result, verse 49, and we'll conclude. <clears throat> and David put his hand in his bag. He took out a stone as he's running to meet him. And he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. He struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran. He stood over the Philistine. He took his sword and he drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. 
They fled. Now, why did they flee? They fled because they put all of their trust in one man. They put all of their trust in one man instead of the main man, instead of the one true God. Instead of putting their trust in the one true God, they put their trust in a man who fell. In church, we can be guilty of the same thing. We can put our trust in our spouses. We can put our trust in our employer. We can put our trust in in our government. We can put our trust in uh, our finances or whatever the case may be instead of putting our trust in our champion, Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty of our sin. He conquered death. And even when it seems like things aren't going well, he ultimately conquers all. And when I read this story, I I ask myself two questions. Number one, who or what am I putting my trust in? And number two, am I letting the fear of my circumstances drive my responses? Am I putting my trust in myself or my own abilities, or am I looking to the Lord? And do I believe that I can overcome through Christ who gives me strength? I want you to pull your note sheets out if you have them. If you don't, uh, kids, you make, sure you're, you make sure your parents get one on the way out because here's your, here's your assignment. Here's your assignment. I want you to have a little family time, and I want you to discuss these questions. Number one, in what ways is our family trusting God right now? In what ways is our family trusting God right now? That's the first question I want you to talk about. The second one is in what ways are we not trusting God right now? What ways are we not trusting God? And, and moms and dads or, or single moms, single dads, I want you to, to let your kids be open and vulnerable to letting your kids share, well, I don't think you're trusting God because the other day I overheard you saying, well, well we're going to have to do such and such because I'm Uh, because there's not enough money or whatever the case may be. So listen to what they say because they may reveal something that they see in your lives that that you're not willing to look at. So in what ways are we not trusting God? Number three, what are some of the things our family can do differently that would demonstrate a greater trust in God? What are those things that our family can do differently that would demonstrate a greater trust in God. And then finally, number four, who or what are some Goliaths in our lives that are taunting us? Who or what are some Goliaths in our lives that are taunting us? And then how would God have us fight them? How would God have us fight them? And listen to your children. Listen to what they say. Uh, don't feed them the, uh, the, the answers. Uh, you're going to be surprised that what they're hearing and what they're thinking and what the Lord is speaking uh, to their hearts. Uh, children have great faith. They have great faith. In many respects, they have greater faith than, than we do. Uh, Jeremy, our, our son, uh, youngest son, he was here with his two daughters on Friday uh, they spent the night, they spent a couple of nights, and uh, uh, last time they were here, you may remember that I uh, bought the Cinderella, ca- we, we bought the Cinderella castle for our granddaughter, remember, and it took us like four days to put it together. Well, she informed, informed us uh, that she's interested in the frozen castle, which I haven't seen that one yet. Some, the stables, and this one was really disappointing I assured her there was no chance of her getting this one the shopping mall have you heard it how many of you have heard of that there's a there's a Lego shopping mall church unite do not buy your children the church the the shopping what's happening to our world that 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 we're building shopping malls out of Legos oh we're just gonna have to set a time for prayer and fasting just for that in, in itself but they were there, and I remember, uh, I often think of, when I think of the faith of a child, I think of my youngest son, who, when he was about four years old, my brother had a headache, and, and we, we had prayed with him, we had uh, laid hands on him, prayed with him a number of times, and 
he had a really bad headache and he was just holding his head like this and Jeremy walked by. He said, what's wrong, Uncle George? And he said, oh, Jeremy, I have a headache. Would you pray for me? And he put his hand on his knee and he said, Lord, heal my Uncle George. And he walked away and his headache went away. There's a lot we can learn from our children. They have great faith. They have great faith. And let me just challenge you in this. It could be that their lack of faith is a reflection of your lack of faith. And I exhort you as parents, be brave enough to just come before the Lord and to say, Lord, is there any area of my faith and my trust and my confidence in you that, that is lacking, that is spilling out over into my children? Be willing as a family to sit down, to ask yourself these questions, uh, to pray through these questions, and then to hear uh, of the responses of your children. Amen? Amen. You kids are awesome. You did. You did great. Amen. You did great. Amen.